The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the next installation of our tips and how-tos with Patrick Duchesne. My name is Joe Salemi, and I'm the Product Marketing Manager with Dynascape Software. Uh, so today we're going to be covering custom swatches in Dynascape Color. A little bit about Patrick for those of you that are first joining us and haven't had a chance to look at the other webinars. Uh, Patrick's a freelance landscape designer. Um, he's got a, he went to Ohio State University for landscape architecture and Hort. Started using Dynascape software back in 2003, so he's been using it for a long time. He's got a wealth of experience, and uh, he just started his own business in 2003. Previous to that, he ran his own, uh, he ran divisions, $2 million divisions, so he's been in the trenches. Uh, he knows exactly what's going on. So for today, uh, first a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we are recording uh, this webinar, so it will be available shortly after uh, this session. We're going to post it on our website and we'll send out the link to everybody. Uh, any questions that you have, please post them in the uh, the questions box and uh, we'll certainly try to get to all the questions. For the ones that we don't, uh, I'll get Patrick to answer them following the webinar and uh, we'll send them out. Today we're going to cover um, why do custom swatches, where to get them, how to get them into Dynascape Color, and then how to use them. Hey Patrick, you ready to start this thing? Hey Patrick, ready to start this thing? Yeah, I am. So I'm going to send this over to you. Can you hear me okay? I'm controlling the screen. Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Okay. Hello, everybody. This is webinar four, and um, this is one that a lot of people have been asking about: doing custom color swatches. In Dynascape Color, which is, in my opinion, what really makes this product dynamic. It has a lot of really good, um, you know, stock or default textures or swatches, but this feature really makes it, um, in my opinion, gives it the superior presentation over any software program out there. But first, I want to go over a couple of recap things. Um, since I've done the first couple webinars, I've spoken to some people, and uh, I'm hearing a couple things that I wanted to just touch base on really quick. One of them is rescaling a drawing, and I apologize if this is a little bit redundant for everybody. I'm not going to take a lot of time on this. I just want to kind of recap this. So this is a this is a great part of the software. You can bring in um, PDFs or JPEGs. We're going to bring in this JPEG. I turn my constraints off. I turn my inference off. I drag this in. So on a plan, you want to find one of two things. You want to find a long dimension or any kind of dimension, whether this building here says 100 feet or 200 feet, or you find a, um, a drawing scale. So this is a little bit blurry. But this here, this, I've seen some people make mistakes with this. Where this says zero, right where my, if, hopefully you can see my, the crosshatch of my uh, mouse, but this is zero, this is 180, so that's 180. But over here is also 40, so 180 and 40 is 220. So what I've seen people do is they'll go to this and they'll put, even though that says it 220, they'll say 180, and they'll accidentally click this end and this end. And now if we go to measure this, this should be 220, and you can see it's not correct. So be very careful when you're rescaling a drawing to do it correctly where this is 220, and you click the left and the right, and now it's scaled. So I know that this building right here is supposed to be like 147 or whatever. It's, well, 131. Yeah, it was 137, 135. So just be careful when you're rescaling drawings, and just check yourself two or three times so you make sure you don't do a drawing in the right scale, because 
that's kind of a bad situation. But there's ways to fix it if you're, you know, if all the stars align and everything's okay. So that's number one. Number two, um, I want to show you something that I started doing um, with pillars. And when I did this, I thought this was kind of a good idea to show everybody. So in your figure library, under rocks, there are pillars. So let's grab like a 30-inch pillar with a light right here, and let's zoom in on this. So when I would do my drawings, um, when I would draw like a wall, I would take like this line, I'd extend it over, and let's say you're going to do a 12-inch wide wall. So we're going to offset that a half a foot this way and a half a foot this way. So then what I would end up doing is this, which probably many people do. I draw these lines, fumble around with cutting this out, you know, these pieces, then I get rid of these lines. But what I've started doing is this. Let's get rid of these, these, and those. I'll go and I'll just take a box and I'll make a box around this thing real fast. So now what I have is a way to cut those out or cut the lines or trim the lines. So then I'll just run my wall this way, this way, and then I'll offset this a half a foot each direction or however wide you want to offset that. I'll delete this and then all I have to do is take my trim tool, run it right down the middle, and that's gone. And then I trim these out. So then I have a, a nice graphically looking um, wall with a pillar. So then if I go to close these things, then I'll just do one of these, you know. Now I have my wall. So I don't know. You might not think that's a real good idea. I thought it was a good idea for me because it saved me from not having to draw all these lines to trim. Okay, that's, that's that. So let's work on some Dynascape color. You're going to be surprised how easy this really is. Um, all right, I'm just going to start from scratch. So we open up our drawing. OK, so I have this labeled. I have all my areas closed. Remember, you can't color anything. You can't color anything unless everything's closed. So when you finish your drawing, like when I finish mine, I'll go through everywhere and check that everything is closed. And you can see everything is closed. That's kind of a, that's a little line that shouldn't be there. So you open up color, and you open up your drawing. So I made one for this webinar called Color Practice Drawing. OK, here's my drawing. It's not on anything fancy. It's just a white piece of paper. So you know, normally, well, like I showed you in one webinar, I'm going to go to this tool here that says send, send the selected item to the background. I'm just going to select all this stuff. Just like throw my mouse all over and click all the ground surfaces. So everything's down at the bottom. So the normal way to color is obviously go in, pick your paper pattern, which is, you know, one of these. Select that. You can take that pattern, you can rotate it on a 45, you can scale it. Um, these are really great. I've seen a lot of, I mean, there are excellent, excellent drawings out there just by using these swatches. So me showing you to do that, how to do this today doesn't mean that I don't like them. It just means that um, the more competitive the industry gets, the more people are using Dynascape, the better you want to be than everybody else. So try to do some different things. So here's what we're going to do. Up here where it says Tools, go to Style Editor. So these are all of those categories that are in here. Um, so let's make a paper pattern. Now, uh, we're going to go collect, we're going to click New. We're going to go to Texture. And we're going to go into our computer where we have some textures already saved. So let's go to 
I have a file called textures and let's just pick Allegro. This is Teco Block Allegro. So I'm going to select it. I'm going to click open. So there's our Allegro. Now I'm going to go into tile or I'm going to click on this where it says none and I'm going to select tile. And then I'm going to scale this just a little bit like this. We can go back and adjust and then I'm going to click update. So right here you can see it's here and I'm going to click update. And then I'm going to click X, and it's going to say the current style has been modified. Would you like to change the save? Change. Would you like to save these changes? I'm going to select yes. Okay. So I'm going to go into my paper patterns. I'm going to select this, and I'm going to click it in here. So you can see that's pretty cool, but those are way, way, way too small. So you can do one of a couple things. The first thing you can do is select it and adjust the scale to where it looks the right size. Now, you can do this, but it will get very repetitive every drawing if you have to resize that. So what I want to do is I'm going to go into my style editor, back to that swatch pattern or whatever you want to call it, and I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. And I'm going to update it. And I'm going to close it out and I'm going to click yes. So let's erase this. And let's go to paper pattern. See now it's gotten a little bigger. It still isn't. It still isn't big enough. I mean, what you can do though, you can go into design and you can measure the width of this space if you want to really make things exact. So that to there is 31 feet. So let's just say those are let's just say they're um, nine inch pavers. So you want to go 31 times 9 divided by 12. So you're going to have like, let's just do 6 because it's a heck of a lot easier. You'd have 62 of those. Um, so if we wanted to make them a little bit bigger again, we'd go back into our style editor, go to paper patterns, go back down, select this again. Let's make them a little bit bigger. Update it. Select X. Yes. Let's click, let's color those again and see what happens. So they're a little bit bigger. Those actually look too big. So the goal is, the goal is to size them correctly. It might take a couple times, but size them correctly. So every time you start a drawing, um, every time you select this, it's the right size and you're not, you're not um, redoing the sizing. So you can, you can rotate this just like you can everything else. You can still mess with the scale if you want. So just because you bring it in at a certain scale doesn't mean you can't adjust it. So where do let's let's make another one. Let's make one more. And then I'm going to show you where I find these. So let's make um, hmm, let's make like a decorative stone. So let's go into stone or let's just put it under stone. I'm going to put new texture. And then let's go, actually no, let's make water. Let's make water. So style editor, we're going to go to water, and I've actually already made it, but I'll make another one. So we're going to go to texture. Um, that's the water I used already. Let's see if I can find, now let's just use the same water. Okay, so we're going to click this. Here's our water. We're going to tile it. And I'm going to just kind of scale it like that and just see how it looks. I'm sure there's a rhyme and a reason for this number. I haven't figured it out yet, but it doesn't take that long to go back and tweak them. So now when we go into our water, I'm probably going to have two of them. Yeah. So if I were to make that a pool, you, the key to finding good swatches is, like, if you see this, um, this line, like, there's a lighter side and a darker side. If you can get swatches that are consistent all the way across, you won't have as many lines. So what I'll usually do is I'll kind of like rotate this a little bit and then play with the scale to where it kind of looks nice. But it looks, um, it looks pretty good. So where do I find these? You can do a couple different things. You can go online and type in like um, mulch texture and click images 
and you can get these. So what you want to make sure is, like if you always select this one, see how it has all these different kind of like there's dark and light sections of it? That's going to repeat a lot through, a, uh, through your swatch. So you want to try to find something pretty consistent. Like this one looks really consistent. I'll bet you if we made this and we saved it, let's make that in our textures. Let's just put, well, let's leave it at mushroom compost just in case you'd ever want to show a bed as mushroom compost. But uh, actually, it might look good for mulch, too. So let's go to Style Editor. Let's go to Mulch and Turf. And we'll make that a texture. So let's go to Mushroom Compost. L-M, Mushroom Compost. So there's the compost. Let's tile it. Scale it a little bit. Update that. X out and click Yes. So let's, where did I save that? Mulch and turf. Right there. So it actually looks pretty good, but it's not the right size. So you can scale it down. That actually looks pretty darn decent. I might keep that. So let's go back there and let's change that. I think we needed to make it smaller. You can also manually type in here too. You could type in like 12 or 10. So I'm just going to put in 10. So um, it's kind of like uh, trial and error, getting these to be the right size. Whoops. Getting these. To, so that's not too bad. And once you start getting plants in there too, it's going to, it will start to detract from, um, it'll start to detract from things. Like if I just color all these, you're not seeing as many textures. I wouldn't even make that one smaller too. Like, and you again, you can type in here also eight. So that looks pretty. I mean, I don't see any. Uh, I don't see any patterning. Maybe right here, but not too bad. So here's. This is a really great place to get paving stones. If you go into SketchUp, you can go to like you can go to manufacturers' um, websites and get swatches. But I thought of a way um, a while ago to even get a better one. So if you go to the 3D warehouse in SketchUp, Teco and Unilock have awesome patterns. If you type in Teco block, these are all the hatch patterns for Teco that they've done an excellent job of getting very good swatches. So I select this, and I'm going to download this, and I'm going to load this into SketchUp. SketchUp is free. You do not need the professional version, whether you're doing this or modeling. So here are my textures. Um, she can go away. We don't need her help. So let's make uh, Harvest Gold. That's one of my favorite Teco colors. So what we're going to do is I want to take this Harvest Gold, and I want to perfectly center it on this screen like I'm doing right now. So make sure that top margin is kind of even, slide it down, zoom in, and keep testing. So I'm not perfect yet. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Let's zoom in. So what you want to do is try to make sure, like, see along the top, the paver joint, and down the left, they're very, very um, even. You know, they're not crooked. So we have a full screen of Teco Block Allegro Harvest Gold. So then I'm going to export this as a 2D graphic. And I'm going to save this in my texture library as um, Allegro Harvest Gold. Okay. So if I go to, um, so I can close this now. I don't need SketchUp anymore. So if I go into my into my uh, textures folder, if I go to Allegro, there's there's Harvest Gold, which is exactly what we had. So now we'll go in color. We'll go Tools, Style Editor, uh, Paver Patterns. You can put these anywhere. You can put them in Paver Pattern A, Paver and Pattern B. You can make your own category, but I just stick with what's in pavers so I don't congest this. 
So I'm going to go new texture, and I'm going to go get Allegro. So there's that texture I, I just made in SketchUp. So I'm going to scale this. I'm going to update it. I'm going to click X, and I'm going to save it. So now I'm going to go to Paver Patterns, Allegro, and there's my Allegro. So I have a little joint here in the center you can see, but I really don't care. That's no big deal. So now I can take my Allegro. Well, hold on a second. I can take my Allegro, and then I can put uh, this color Allegro in the middle of it. I can select this. I can make it a little bit smaller. If I want to, I can to make these the same size. Like if this came in larger, all I have to do is click on this Allegro, and I can see that it's a seven. But that's too short, or that's too small. Um, so now it's a 12, and I can select on the, I think that is um, autumn red. So I can make that into 12 too. Actually, it didn't work because I scaled them differently when I brought them in. Borders, I usually just do a solid color because as you can see, it's hard to do. Um, that's not a realistic joint. So I'll either do like a solid color like that, um, and then have the, uh, the good stuff in the middle. Or if you made all the, por the, the pavers around the border, you could select one and it will color all those. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. That's color. Um, let's make lawn. So I started making uh, swatches, like custom textures for plants a while ago, um, but it, it's not worth it. It got really busy. So really what I do is I'll just I'll make sure I get the important areas covered, like um, like this one was one I made the other day because I was doing a work for a client in Louisiana who uses pine straw. So you can use pine straw. Um, here's my grass. That's not grass. Let's erase that. That's grass. Um, on these areas like grass, graphically, I always kind of fade them out. Like you can do this. You can fade it out a little bit because as you zoom out, you don't want that grass to graphically dominate a plan. You want it just like, just kind of like, whoop, just kind of like that. The same concept is when you're color rendering, like anything that's on the ground plane is usually a little bit lighter than what's on top. So you can make opacity lighter on that. You can make opacity lighter on that. So, I mean, in a nutshell, that's textures, or uh, yeah, custom textures. Now, you can also make um, solids, too. What solid is good for is like cars. Um, or like if you wanted to use um, stainless steel, like I have stainless steel in here, so if I wanted to color a grill stainless steel, it's stainless steel. And then I haven't rescaled this yet, but you can rescale it, and so that's real stainless steel. But I'm going to make a couple, I think, for cars, because these aren't great for cars. So I'll just go in and I'm going to get it um, solid. So then I'll just kind of move these around until I find a color that I want. So let's make let's make like that color of a car. I don't even know what you'd call it. You can also name it too. Blue car color. And I'll update this and I'll X this and I'll save it. So now when I go to my accessories, I can color my car blue. And I can kind of fade it out, well, a little. You don't want to see papers through it, but you don't want your car to be too, uh, too bold either. So then you can just shadow your car like this, and then just take your medicine dropper and medicine drop that car. And so that's blue now too. So real quick, make sure where, whatever swatches you're going to make, you're in the right style here marker hybrid, which is what I use. So again, it's just under style editor. And you want to select where you're going to put it first. And you're going to go new, 
texture, select your texture, resize it, and you're done. That's it. That's custom texturing. Um, one more thing I forgot to show you, because this is something that I never learned, or I, I learned it, but I never used it very much, but I'm starting to use it more and more, and probably a lot of you are using this, but it's putting a shrub along a line. Normally, I would do this. I'd make like, let's just say that's a three foot wide boxwood, and I'd start copying this along my line, and I'd do this. And then, obviously, you can do this where you can really speed it up and copy this over. But the more I practice this tool, the more I'm really enjoying using it, where it's this one right here where you hover over it and it says offset figures along an existing line at absolute value. So if this is three foot wide and you want to overlap them, you want to, you want to offset it by maybe like 2.75 feet. Make sure a copy is on. You select this and you select the line. That one's a little off. And now look what you have. You just have a lot of boxwoods along that line. It works even if you draw a polyline like this. And let's say we have a five foot shrub. Let's put five, five. Click it on there. So let's offset that maybe 4.75. This is, it's, it's a big time-saving tool. It overlaps really not that much. So then you just undo that. And I know I need to just offset it maybe four and a half feet. So I select this, this, a little bit better. Not enough for me. But see what happens? Look how much time that saved where you're not drawing every single shrub. So then to group them, all you do is just go here drag your box around every single one of them, group them, wait for them to group. It's when you group a lot of things together, I wasn't really smart there. It's better to group like five at a time or ten and then keep doing it. But So now these are here. You can go start labeling those with whatever you want. When you bring them into color, they'll color at the same time. So. I think that's about it. Um, the next webinar, I want to work on uh, making your own toolbars, which are these, where you can make your own that has all the commands in it that you use, so you're not jumping back and forth, opening up these and closing these, which, I mean, I'm still pretty fast using these, but, you know, you always want to get faster and more efficient, so I'm going to try to make that an easy thing to teach and show everybody. And then if anybody has any other ideas of things that you're having problems with or you think isn't working right or you want quicker, just email Joe or, or me and we'll make sure we touch on the things that we get feedback from the most. So if anybody has questions on anything I've said today, you know how to get a hold of Joe and um, Joe usually shows his contact info or my contact information after the webinar. So that's it for today and I'll hand it back over to you, Joe. Hey Patrick. Um, so I've got a couple of questions that have uh, just come up. Um, the first one from Cassie. Uh, she wants to know um, do you have to worry about swatches being overwritten with um, when you do updates to color. So when Dynascape issues an update, uh, do you need to worry about um, your custom swatches being overwritten? That is a good question, and that is something you'd want to ask tech support. My gut feeling would be probably yes, because I would think it kind of reprograms the, the textures, but um, that's a tech support thing. But I've made the mistake and accidentally reinstalled color and I lost them, but it doesn't take that long to insert them anyway. But ask Dynascape, or ask Dynascape about that one. But that's a good question. Okay, so I have another one uh, from Thomas Lawson. Uh, wondering if you'd be able to show um, quickly uh, swatches for trees and shrubs.
Okay. Um, so let's say we want to make knockout roses. So we're going to go up to tools, 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 style editor, and let's put it under shrubs, and let's go to texture. Now, I used to have, okay, so let's make uh, annual, this is a perfect one. Let's say we want to make a ground cover of annuals. So I'm going to select annual Vinca. Um, I'm going to tile it, and let's just kind of do this. I'm going to click update. Where what? No, no, see, remember I said be careful where you put those? I wasn't careful. So let's put those in, um, let's like put them in perennials. Or you could put them in, you can make your own annuals. So annual Vinca show, or open. Let's tile it. Let's scale it to maybe like this for now. Update it. See, watch what happens up here. When I click update, it resales that. X out. Click yes. So now let's go to perennials. Let's go down and click this. So obviously that's too big. So let's scale that down to like six or nine. So uh, if I color this a little bit better so we don't have the same plant everywhere, this actually looks pretty darn good. And then you could maybe play with the opacity a little bit like that. So that's how you do that. You could do the same thing like with a knockout rose. If you wanted to make um, for knockout roses, actually I made one that looked pretty cool once. I don't know if I, see if I have it anymore. Like there's fire, I made one for fire. Uh, there's wave petunias, that was a good one. Here, let's do this one, wave petunias. Let's just pretend that's a knock, no, let's not use that one. Well, you can delete these out. Um, Let's make one for, uh, where was that texture? Let's just pretend these are, let's just pretend they're wave petunias. No, Okami cherry, that's even better. Okay, so let's stretch this, or let's tile it. Do that. I don't know how good this is going to look, because I haven't used that one in a while, so I kind of forget what it looked like. Click yes. So if this was like a weeping cherry, and I go to, tr oh, where did I put that? Shrubs? There. Yeah. yeah, that, well, if I play with the scale, though, see? So, it starts, you just have to really be careful how much you customize too many trees and shrubs. I mean, that actually looks pretty good now. If I play with the opacity of it, too, from a distance, it looks kind of realistic. But you'll be the judge of that as you do this. Like, I guess I would use that if, it sh if I shadowed it. You know, you can really start doctoring this up and playing with a lot of the other tools to start. So actually, it looks pretty, I think it looks pretty good. And then we'll put it to the top. Okay? So that's trees and shrubs. It's easy. You're, doing, you're just doing the same exact thing you do for pavers and grass and, and um, mulch beds. You'll just do the same thing for your, your shrubs and trees. Cool. Thanks for that, Patrick. Hey, uh, one more from uh, Robert Kazam. Um, he's asking about um, a black river rock texture. Uh, is there anything different that you do there uh, versus something else? Not really. Um, here, under, where is it? Rock? No. Stone? So here's like a decorative stone I made. It's a little blocky, but here, let's, let's not put it in the, let's put it over here. So this would be just like the river stone um, that he wants to make, uh, but this is more like a Delaware blend. So when you reduce that size, it looks pretty darn real. I mean, you see joints here, but when you, when you start coloring everything and you start shadowing, you start creating more distractions to the eye. You know, let's let's color this rock uh, duh, 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 like that. You really start creating distractions, and from a distance when it's printed, you don't you don't really pick up on that much. Um, you know, for for wall caps, you know, like that right there, that's Techo Block um, Euro Cat. 
um, like mulch, turf, paver, stone. Here's granite. I mean, the sky's the limit with this, really. Whoop, it's not grouped or closed. So there's my granite. And then you can play with the granite texture and scale that back a little bit, too. So this, like I was saying in the beginning, I don't care what anybody says. This is a superior feature over any design and color pro, uh, landscape design program on the market to make things realistic. And here's a great benefit of this. 3D modeling is becoming very big. I'm doing a lot of modeling now because clients are having more and more trouble see, or, um, understanding what things are going to look like. But when you can show them things like this, where it's very realistic and you have actual colored pavers with actual borders and actual mulch in these areas, like that's bluestone right there, you can save yourself some time for modeling. Uh, modeling is time consuming. It is very rewarding as far as your ability to sell a job and your, uh, your closing rate when you have 3D modeling is, is really high. But if you don't have it in the budget or the design um, budget for modeling, when you do realistic things like this, this at least allows a customer to see what the actual material is going to look like. Like that's Teco Block Blue 60 millimeter. I'm going to rotate it on a 73 degree angle, which I hope nobody ever does. But so there's your river stone. It's just the wrong color. <laughs> but to go find that, you would go here. I would go, um, I, I think there's one that's called Mexican River Stone Texture. And if you click images, you want to go through and find a good one. Like, that's cool. Let's make that real quick so you can see I'm not making this up. Mexican River Stone. Okay, so it's here. So if I click it, there's my, this actually, I'll bet this is going to look pretty good. So. I'm going to go to my style editor. I'm going to go to stone. I'm going to go to new, texture. I'm going to go find that Mexican river stone. And right there, open it, tile it, scale it a little bit. We'll figure out how close it is. Close this out. Click yes. So let's see how that one looks. Whoa, that's pretty good. It's actually, it's actually really good. Uh, five. Wow, that's probably one. Of, yeah, that's. I'm gonna brag because that looks good. So there's your river stone, your Mexican river stone, and then it it works the same as any other properties of textures you would get here. You can bring it to the forefront. You can put it to the background. Here's one more thing, everybody. Remember this. See how this line is behind it. Don't mess around with throwing all these things to the background. Just click, watch what happens to this line. Click Control T, and it brings all your lines to the foreground. Remember, Control T is the last thing you want to do in a drawing so your text doesn't get, or your, your um, huh, my tool isn't working right now. So you don't get buried, your, uh, your lines don't get buried. Control T pops that up. Okay? That was a very long way of showing how to make Mexican river stone, but that's Mexican river stone. Hey Patrick, I got uh, two more questions, um, but the uh, the first one, um, um, people want to know, um, do you always go to Google or uh, a source to get your images, or do you ever take your own? I do. I do. Um, I took, where is that picture? I have done my own, uh, but it's gone. But yes, you can take your own pictures as long as you get a good view like this where it's balanced. Um, another good site is 
well, this is an awesome site for uh, SketchUp stuff. Write that one down, SketchUpTexture.com. But it has, this has some really nice textures in it, too. You could use for roofs or something. But there's also a, um, a, pro, a site called CG Textures. This has some really interesting stuff, too. I don't use this a lot. But you can use this for wood. See, that would repeat those. So you have to really, there's bones. I don't know why you'd ever use bones, but um, you want to be careful with some of these because they'll repeat, like this dark pattern will repeat. But yeah, you can take your own pictures, just making sure it's a good high resolution. You don't have any shadows in the pictures. Um, actually, Joe, you and I, when we were on our trip the other day, uh, I went to a wall and took pictures of, of stone so I could have that for a wall stone. So I, I still do it. So. The answer is yes. And so um, uh, that'll wrap up our questions. Uh, there was another question that um, someone had um, about uh, asking if we're going to have any webinars on 3D modeling. And I think Gina was the one that asked that question. Uh, so yes, eventually. Um, we are going to get into do some uh, quick tips and tricks on um, using SketchUp and uh, how to do some 3D modeling. Um, but in the meantime, if you have any questions, uh, you can get a hold of Patrick. His email address is patrick at DuchesneDesignSolutions.com. Uh, you can get a hold of me directly. Um, my email is jsalemi at Dynascape.com. Uh, and again, this webinar uh, is recorded. And we're going to be posting it to uh, the Dynascape website shortly after um, we get off the line here. So I just want to say thanks to everybody. Thanks to Patrick for his time. And um, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, email those directly to me, and we'll make sure that they get answered. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your time, uh, and hope you join us for the next one.